Disclaimer, presented for historical purposes only, may contain violent and offensive imagery. Berlin, 1945. There are no ruins yet. In a fervor of nationalism, the troops marched to war, colors streaming and bands playing. Dazzling pomp surrounds the Kaiser. Legends arise about generals such as Hindenburg and Ludendorff who stem the Russian advances in the east and finally take over command of the whole German army. War is brutal. The greatest war to date proves the effectiveness of new weapons of destruction. Poison gas is used and advances made with tanks. War is carried on in the air, and a ruthless war at sea with a submarine as a new weapon is proclaimed. The Russian Empire is the first to collapse. The November Revolution brings the Bolsheviks to power, and in 1918, Lenin makes peace with Germany.
After the last German great offensive miscarried, the sailors in Kiel light the flame of revolution. The Kaiser abdicates and the Republic is proclaimed in Berlin. The revolutionary tide carries forward Karl Liebknecht, the man who voted against the war of the Kaiser's empire. He is now followed by the masses. Real power, however, is not with the Social Democrats who have formed the government, but with the army chiefs on whom they lean. The workers' movement is split in two. The left radical insurrection inspired by Liebknecht is crushed by the army called in by the Social Democratic government. Liebknecht and many of his supporters are murdered. At Versailles, the victors dictate their peace terms. The young republic pays the price of a lost war. Alsace-Lorraine becomes French, Posen and West Prussia Polish, and Memel Lithuanian. Germany is deprived of her colonies and has to pay war damages to the victors. Otherwise, however, Germany remains intact. The new free city of Danzig retains its German character, and the Rhineland, although a militarized zone, remains German soil. The war industries are dismantled, and the army restricted to 100,000 professional soldiers. But Germany's sovereignty is not endangered. The Social Democrat, Ebert, rules as president. He needs the support of the army to maintain the authority of the young democracy in the face of the many national groups which refuse to admit defeat and still less to accept the terms of the peace treaty. The foreign minister, Rathenauer, is murdered by nationalist fanatics because he wishes to adhere to the peace terms. In Bavaria, the army and the Free Corps conduct their own violent policies and refuse to recognize the authority of Berlin. General von Epp finances extreme nationalist elements from secret army funds. His adjutant, Captain Röhm, hires spies to report on the activities of these elements. One of these spies becomes member number seven of the new National Socialist Party, on which he is to report. With the help of Rem's money, he even becomes leader of the party. In 1920, he is the party spokesman at meetings protesting against the peace treaties with the Allies and Russia. This Adolf Hitler was born on April 20th, 1889, in the small Austrian town of Braunau, the son of the 50-year-old customs official Alois Hitler and his 28-year-old third wife, Clara. When Adolf is eight years of age, the family moves to a small house in Leonding, near Linz. Here, father and son disagree. Alois Hitler wishes the boy to become an official. Adolf wants to be an artist. He defies his father. He is a poor sort of pupil and fails in his exams both in Linz and in Steyr. At the age of 16, he falls ill with tuberculosis and leaves school forever. In 1907, he moves to Vienna, seeks admittance to the Academy of Art, but is not accepted. He shares a furnished room with a friend. Turned away from the Academy of Art a second time, he becomes a part-time laborer and hawker of postcards painted by himself. He lands in a flop house, but considers himself superior to the other tramps. For a few coppers, he buys his first anti-Semitic pamphlets. These are part of the Ostara Library for the blonde defenders of the rights of man. In order to obtain certain numbers no longer in circulation, Hitler looks up Ostara's publisher, Jörg Lanz von Liebenfels who, in 1900, founded an order for blonde, blue-eyed men. According to Lance, the blonde superman sits differently from and has different toes from the dark and inferior races whose extermination he demands. He depicts world history as a life-and-death struggle between the blonde and the dark. The swastika is his sign, 
and for him, the Jew is the devil himself. These pipe dreams are a revelation to the unemployed, starving hermit in the flophouse. Hitler must believe in the difference between people and races so that he can count himself among the master race. His due for military service, he has left Austria and settled in Munich. His call-up papers reach him there, and in fear of the police, he musters but is turned down because of poor health. In Munich, he leads the same life as in Vienna. Only on the outbreak of war is there an end to his isolation and deprivation. On August 1st, 1914, he stands in the middle of a singing and cheering crowd on the Odeonplatz in Munich and listens to the proclamation of the declaration of war. In a wave of enthusiasm, he volunteers and becomes an orderly in the infantry regiment List. He is wounded at the Western Front in 1916, but returns in 1917 as a vice corporal. In 1918, his eyes are injured during a British gas attack, and he is in the hospital when the armistice puts an end to the war. Again, he is an unemployed hermit, a man without family and job. He decides to become a politician and goes to Munich where the most desperate elements among the Free Corps have gathered. Earlier, the Free Corps was organized to defend Germany's eastern frontiers under the supervision of the army, but now they stand prepared to blow the Republic to bits. In reply to the question whether there are political murder gangs in Bavaria, the chief of police in Munich replies, certainly, but not enough. Officers such as Epp and Röhm consider that allegiance to the Fatherland implies disloyalty to the Republic. Röhm discovers Hitler's talents and employs him to immunize the soldiers against socialistic and pacifist ideas. On April 1st, 1920, Hitler leaves the army to devote himself entirely to his new party. As a speaker, his theory materializes that a leader is one who can move the masses. He is aware that violence appeals to many and frightens others. Battle groups are organized. Many Free Corps soldiers join Hitler's storm troops, the SA, and start regular battles with the socialists and communists. Unemployed officers like Captain Goering and rabid race fanatics like the schoolteacher Streicher join the party. General Ludendorff is won over by the Nazis. The confused situation in the country serves Hitler's policy. The inability of a bankrupt society to meet its obligations to France results in French occupation of the Ruhr district, which deals a death blow to the currency. The inflation ruins the middle classes and the workers. Hitler holds the Republic responsible for the distress and misery. Consequently, he tries to concentrate all the anti-Republican groups in Catholic Bavaria against Protestant Berlin. On November 8th, Hitler makes a desperate attempt to get the government of the Federated State of Bavaria and the army to join him. He forces his way into a house in Munich where the city leaders are gathered and proclaims a national government in place of the legal federal government. The house is surrounded by the SA. Ludendorff throws his prestige on the scales and Hitler enforces his will. The Munich government, however, retains its liberty. The Bavarian army receives orders from Berlin not to participate in the putsch, which is consequently doomed to failure. On November 9th, to save the situation, Hitler and Ludendorff, at the head of a few thousand men, march to army headquarters. Many men later to gain notoriety follow them. Heinrich Himmler is a color guard. After a short exchange of fire, 16 Hitlerites and three policemen lie dead or dying. Hitler escapes and is arrested two days later. During the subsequent legal proceedings, Ludendorff is acquitted and Hitler is imprisoned for a few months in the fortress at Landsberg, where he is given a roomy cell on the first floor with good food and the privilege of wearing his own clothes. Full of contempt for an opponent who punishes high treason so leniently, he dictates his book Mein Kampf, an autobiography which turns into a political platform, to his faithful friend, Rudolf Hess. Here, Hitler describes the reuniting of Germany and Austria as his life's mission. He exclaims that either Germany shall become a world power or be ruined. He maintains that during the war, poison gas should have been used on tens of thousands of Jews in order to prevent the collapse. 
The book was read by few and made a joke of by many. A few years later, they no longer laughed. While Hitler is in Landsberg, the situation improves in Germany. In February 1925, President Ebert dies. He is succeeded by Paul von Hindenburg, the Kaiser's field marshal who, nominated by the parties of the right, wins the election by a narrow margin. To begin with, Hindenburg respects the Constitution, but after a while, his age, his political inexperience, and military philosophy claim their right. When Hitler leaves Landsberg, he has to reorganize the party. He sets to work with well-tried means. In February 1925, the Nazis hold their first large meeting after the putsch. Hitler speaks of Germany's future in our movement, and Jews are not admitted. Even the prohibition against public speaking, which certain German states have published against him, is made use of for his propaganda. The brown shirts began the march to power. In 1926, the party has 17,000 members. In 1927, 40,000. In 1928, 60,000. They have not yet conquered the streets. The streetcars still drive through their ranks. The party days become shows, with essay parades and the veterans Goering, Streicher, and Epp forging their plans. At cleverly directed meetings, Hitler consecrates the colors and inspires his faithful with violent hate harangues. In 1926, Hitler finds the man to organize the party fight in Berlin and supervise the party propaganda, Goebbels. The political battle is now conducted with all means. Fights at meetings and in the streets occur daily. The big parties mobilize semi-military organizations. The Social Democrats have the Reich Banner and the Communists the Rot Front Kampferbund. Under the leadership of Telmann, the communists hold their position. When Hitler comes to power, they are the strongest party in Berlin. continued agitation and the hostile demonstrations of the SA are very convenient to the industrialists. They need someone to mobilize the masses against the communists. Money begins to flow from industry into the coffers of the party. In 1930, the number of unemployed rises to three million, and Hitler turns their fear and despair to his own use. Hitler gives them faith and promises them work and bread. Gerade sieben Mann hoch war, sprach sie schon zwei Grundsätze aus. Erstens, sie wollte eine wahrhaftige Weltanschauungspartei sein. Und zweitens, sie wollte daher kompromisslos die einzige Macht und alleinige Macht in Deutschland. This platform gains for Hitler more than six million votes and 106 seats in the Reichstag in the elections of 1929. He is now the leader of the nation's second largest party. The Chancellor, Brüning, has no parliamentary support for measures against want. He is forced to govern by means of a paragraph which gives President Hindenburg the right to issue decrees. Hitler blames Brüning for the distress and declares his government incompetent. Hitler now changes his tactics. He will only make his revolution when he has come to power. Then terror is legally protected. Thus the police have no excuse to intervene against the SA and he can win the confidence of the army. In several actions against his sympathizers, Hitler swears he wants to assume power legally. He 
is helped by the party lawyer, Hans Frank. And the brown uniforms, Hitler's men put on white shirts instead and marched through the towns as usual. Many unemployed are enticed by the adventurous glamour which Goebbels' propaganda builds up around these processions and the bloody battles with political opponents. Industrialists such as Kirchdorf and Thiessen finance Hitler's next election campaign and hope to be able to control him later. Hitler flies from town to town. Goebbels has discovered a new slogan, Hitler over Germany. The election is for President of the Reich. To become a candidate, Hitler in 1932 becomes a German citizen. His friend Frick, a minister in the state of Braunschweig, swears in his Führer as counselor, which automatically makes him a German citizen. Hindenburg is nominated by the Social Democrats, Catholics, and Liberals. Who will save us from Hitler? Only Hindenburg. Hindenburg is re-elected, and Hitler seems to be on a dead-end street. He is saved by General Schleicher, who exercises his political power behind the scenes. He promises Hitler to overthrow Brüning and proclaim new elections, providing Hitler, until further notice, accepts a government under Franz von Papen, a conservative politician whom Schleicher wants to use as a puppet. Schleicher himself is a member of Papen's cabinet, which is made up of seven barons, two industrialists, and one lawyer. The fate of the nation is no longer in the hands of its chosen representatives in the Reichstag, but depends on the way in which Hindenburg exercises his power, which in turn is either decided by his son Oskar, a friend of Schleicher, or at the coffee table at his country estate, Neudeck. These men also intrigue against one another. Schleicher overthrows Papen and becomes chancellor. In order to overthrow Schleicher, Papen suggests a Hitler government to Hindenburg, in which the Nazis are to be in a minority among the conservative ministers, with Papen as vice-chancellor and real leader. Thus, Hitler becomes chancellor. The Social Democrats lose their last position when the Prussian Prime Minister Braun allows himself to be deposed without opposition by Papen. government meets. The vice chancellor sits next to Hitler and Goering in the belief that he can control them. That same night, the SA pay homage to Hindenburg and Hitler with a torchlight procession. In the darkness, the terror begins against defenseless anti-fascists who are dragged from their homes and beaten up in the cellars of the SA. The first public appearance of the new regime in Berlin 
is at the state funeral of an S.A. man and a policeman killed during one of the nightly battles. The ex-crown prince is also present. Ein junger deutscher Arbeiter, aufrecht, stolz, der Kamerad seiner Kameraden und der Führer seiner Gefolgschaft, wie all die anderen, die Hunderttausende, jeder vorbei an dem greisen Reichspräsidenten und dem jungen Reichskanzler. Das, was er geträumt hatte, das ist nun Wirklichkeit, das Junge und das alte Deutschland reichen sich die Hände. On February 10, Hitler makes his first speech as Chancellor in Berlin. In this way, an election campaign starts under the sign of terror. 
Goering appoints 40,000 SA and SS men as auxiliary policemen, and the terror is legal. On February 27, 1933, the Reichstag burns down. After the war, Goering admits that already before the fire, he had made up lists of communists and others who were to be arrested. The Nazi propaganda blames the communists for the fire, which becomes the excuse for a law outlawing Hitler's opponents. The Dutchman van der Lubbe was arrested in the Reichstag on the night of the fire, and four communists are brought to court. The proceedings, however, only show that the Dutchman must have had accomplices and that the communists are innocent. The accused Bulgarian, Dimitrov, says straight out that only the Nazis had the opportunity of setting fire to the Reichstag and gaining advantage from it. His pointed questions make Goering furious. In the election, Hitler obtains 43.9% of all votes. He still needs the army and the German nationalists. Consequently, the new regime is to appear as the inheritor of the Prussian tradition and the new Reichstag is opened at Potsdam, the city of Frederick the Great. Army and SA gather in the old garrison church. The old and the new Germany salute one another. The Kaiser's field marshal in pre-war dress uniform and the unknown soldier from the Western Front in correct morning coat. Two days later, the party shows its true colors. The Reichstag meets at the Kroll Opera, which was replaced the old Reichstag. They are to vote for the law, which will make Hitler a dictator. The building is surrounded by the SS and the SA, who in chorus threaten terror if the law is not passed. Providing the 81 communist votes are declared invalid, and Hitler is supported by the German nationalists and the Catholics, his law will be passed. Most of the communists and a dozen social democrats have already been arrested. The remaining social democrats alone vote against the law. Aber es ist dabei nicht nur um das negative Problem der Bekämpfung dieser Lehre und ihrer Organisationen handelt, sondern um die Durchführung der positiven Aufgabe der Gewinnung des deutschen Arbeiters für den Nationalstaat. Die Reichsregierung braucht daher nicht, durch dieses Ermächtigungsgesetz die Länder aufzuheben. Wohl aber wird sie diejenigen Maßnahmen treffen, die von nun ab und für immer eine Gleichmäßigkeit der politischen Intentionen in Reich und in den Ländern gewährleisten. Es ist Sache des Reichstags nun mehr seinerseits eine klare Stellung einzunehmen. Am Schicksal des Kommunismus und der sich mit ihm verbrüdenden anderen Organisationen ändert dies nicht. In order to assume power in all Germany, however, Hitler did not await the passing of this law. Already on March the 9th, Epp and Röhm were allowed free hands for a coup in Bavaria. They overthrow Helt's government and take over the key positions in Munich without interference from the army. Old scores from 1923 are settled. Similar coups are carried out in other states.
In Prussia, Goering holds the reins. He presides over the Prussian Senate. The revolution, for a few months, through the whole of Deutschland, broke, began with that that the unbelievable the system of the past, the system of the parliamentarism, of the pacifism, destroyed and destroyed. The Führer has us also in Prussia on our places. We have loved that every man in Prussia his place to it. Some months after assuming power, Hitler has prohibited all parties except his own. The Veterans Association, the Steel Helmets, is absorbed by the SA. Their representatives in the government become party members. The unions are abolished and taken over by the Workers' Front. The newly appointed Minister of Propaganda, Goebbels, organizes the fight against free speech. Heinrich Heine once wrote that where books are burned, people are burned. Now his books are being burned and his Lorelei suddenly becomes a poem by an anonymous author. A German may no longer read Marx and Freud, Barbus and Brecht, Mann and Remark, Zweig and Fortranger. Das nicht auf die Reinheit seiner Rasse hält, geht zugrunde. On April 1, 1933, a boycott of Jewish businessmen, doctors and lawyers is started. Those so suddenly outlawed began to leave the country. Soon Europe is accustomed to the sight of human beings freighted like parcels from country to country. Sie sind Deutschland. Wenn Sie handeln, handelt die Nation. Wenn Sie richten, richtet das Volk. Whosoever stands in Hitler's way is outlawed. This Röhm is to learn. In order to succeed Hindenburg, Hitler needs the support of the army. The SA of Röhm is a threat to the ancient privileges of the army. Consequently, in 1934, Hitler has Röhm and other party veterans executed without trial on the excuse that they are planning a coup. This action is carried out by the SS. Its chief, Himmler, starts out on the road to the highest post in the police. On the party day, Hitler receives the oath of allegiance from the new SA chief, Lutze. Mein Führer, genau wie in früheren Zeiten, wir unseren Dienst und unsere Pflicht getan haben, werden wir auch künftig nur auf Ihre Befehle warten. Und wir Kameraden kennen nicht anders The new colors are dedicated by touching the so-called blood standard from the November coup in Munich in 1923. The party is welded together. The army has been given its guarantees. The generals little know that soon Himmler's SS are going to realize Röhm's dream of the one-party army. On the death of Hindenburg, on August 2nd, 1934, the government immediately passes a law uniting the functions of chancellor and president. 
on the very same day officers and men swear the oath of allegiance not to germany or the constitution but to hitler personally in eighteen months hitler has assumed absolute power across the opposition the nazi revolution is a fact